Hello, my name is Carrie Franceman and I am a comic writer and illustrator. This talk is a hybrid of two papers given at the Graphic Medicine Conference at Leeds Art College and Transition 2 New Directions in Comic Studies Conference in Birkbeck University of London. The title is The Body as a Canvas in Comics An Artist Explores the Influence of corporal studies in the creation of her graphic novel, The House That Groans. I have to confess straight up that although I came from a long line of academics, I am in fact a comic artist. In the last year, I have attended several comic studies conferences and have been bowled over by the exciting ways in which academics are inspired to analyse comics in their many forms. I would like to show you today how comic artists also use academic theory to inspire their art, as I have done in the last year while writing my graphic novel, The House That Groaned, which is published by Random House's Square Peg. I have always been fascinated in bodies and the great anxieties our society seems to feel toward them, highlighted by authors such as Susie Orbach in Bodies 2009. My graphic novel was greatly inspired by the sociology of the body and by key corporal theorists from Judith Butler to Susan Bordeaux and Norbert Elias. Corporal studies became popular among sociologists in the 80s following Michel Foucault's hugely influential writing. The body was rescued from biology as sociologists began to understand the huge importance of the body as a site for power struggle. Controlling the body allowed those in power to control population size, reinforce compulsory heterosexuality and gender division, and punish those who deviated from these norms. They began to see how the body was like a book that could be read in different ways that benefited different people. For example, since Aristotle to the present day, biologists often describe conception in terms of the passive egg and the active sperm. Feminists, however, show that, in fact, the sperm often lolled around for as long as three days waiting for the egg to rise, and that the muscular contractions of the uterus were essential in aiding fertilization. Clearly, even biological fact can be a tool for power discourse that paint the male sperm as active and in control and the female egg as passive, and that reinforces the differences between genders over the similarities. The Western body has been subjected to many metaphors, from book, to box, and even canvas. It was Connell's metaphor which most inspired me when she suggested that the individual body can be studied as a canvas on which the anxieties and discourses of the larger social body are reproduced. As Connell showed, the body was not detached as an individual separate from society, but seeped in historical, cultural, class, racial and gendered symbolism. And Foucault showed us that the body was not just a passive object inscribed with social symbols, but it was also active, inscribing and disciplining other bodies itself. When I began to write my own graphic novel, I returned to that Connell idea, and it struck me how rev relevant it was not just to corporal studies, but also to the study of comics. Comics have long been associated with some of the most extreme body morphing characters of any medium, from the bizarre and terrifying images of horror manga to the supervillains of Marvel and DC. When bodies are constructed in, in film, much is down to chance. What actress or actor the budget can afford, the image the stylist chooses, how the actress delivers, decides to play the part or deliver the line. In comics, however, the character's bodies are constructed from the word go, tapping directly into the unconscious and imagination of, in most cases, just one individual. Every choice, gender, hair colour, clothes, shape, mannerism, movement, even the environment they are set in, is a deliberate choice, be it conscious or unconscious. 
and there are no biological limits. With pen in hand, bodies can be stretched and morphed into any shape. And it is this which makes the bodies of comic book characters such interesting hotbeds of activity on which to examine the desires and anxieties of the larger social body. Robert Crumb is of course a perfect example of someone who has used the medium's lack of censorship to channel his innermost thoughts into creating shocking characters. A quote from the R. Crumb Coffee Table Art Book 1997 explains, With the increasing use of psychedelics in the late 1960s and early 1970s, many people found the burden of holding up a social facade at varying with their own innermost thoughts increasingly unsupportable. Robert Crumb, for example, responded to this tension by letting his art become a conduit for whatever was deep and unspoken, regardless of whether what came up was morally good or whether it made him appear to be a good person. It was in this context that he put on paper the racist imagery that he found bubbling up out of him. I would argue that the act of creating a comic is intensely personal, unlike a film or photography usually created alone in a studio or bedroom. That fact, combined with the underground subversive nature of the medium, makes it so unique. A rummage through any small press table at any comic convention reveals many strange, subversive and graphic sexual and violent images. Evident, I think, of a medium that can easily tap into the darkest, most unconscious corners of the artist's mind. Comics are, by their very nature, rather subversive. Henry Pratt, 2009, explored the importance of caricatures in comics and their subversive qualities. He says, True, caricatures in comics enable stereotyping, but it also enables the articulation of alternative viewpoints, expressions of which is largely forbidden in more reputable contexts. The fact that it is not regarded as serious allows it to be used to convey serious and profound qualms about the political establishment and prevailing institutional mores. In this light, we can perhaps see how the bodies of comic characters are themselves not just passive objects, but also active, challenging or sustaining dominant discourses for those bodies who view them. My graphic novel, The House That Groaned, explores Western society's anxieties, fantasies, and experiences of embodiment through six characters living in a house. Although the book had its roots in these theories, my main aim while creating it was to tell a good story, and so I let my imagination run wild. In this way, the characters are both conscious and unconscious products of these theories. It is set in a converted Victorian building with six one-bedroom apartments housing six lonely individuals. On the outside, it is indeed lovely, but on the inside, the building is, like each of us, slowly decaying. Pipes are bursting, electricity is failing, and cracks are forming. These incidents force the individual residents out of their little apartment and into contact with each other, reminding the characters of their own mortality. Each has their own story and their own relationship with their bodies. The inhabitants of 141 Rotten Road could only have stepped out of the pages of the comic book. There's our heroine Barbara, the man-made Barbie, Matt, the retoucher who cannot touch, Janet, the tormented dietitian, Marion, the hedonistic matriarch of the Midnight Feast Front, Demi Durbach, a grandmother who literally blends into the background, and Brian, the twenty-something bloke who's sexually attracted to diseased and dying women. Yet as we learn the stories behind these extreme characters, it becomes apparent that we may share similar issues as individuals and as a society. Let's start by meeting Mrs Demi Durbach, an 81-year-old grandmother who grew up in the Scottish Highlands, living at one with the earth. Now, Widowed and imprisoned inside her ageing body at the top of a flat, she's taken to hiding herself, blending into her environment like a moth with bark patterned wings. See if you can find her here. 
I came up with this character as a contrast to Norbert Elias's 1939 idea of the home of clauses in the civilizing process. His two volumes trace the process from medieval society by which we begin to see ourselves as individuals separate from society. He examined etiquette books and found that in the medieval era expressions of impulses were high. People shared one pot of food, urinated and defecated in public, sat on the floor and broke wind at the table. Like Mrs. Durba, they experienced their bodies as part of the environment through birth, death, expulsion of bodily waste, eating and sex. In short, people were homo apparati, or open men. Bakhtin, in 1984, explored medieval carnival caricatures of the time with emphasis on bodily orifices. Carnival caricatures, like comics, were seen as lowbrow, but this allowed them to be subversive, showing rude and strange images that depicted the people's experiences of embodiment. Elias argued that increases in communication and transport resulted in higher levels of population density and lengthening chains of interdependency. This new society produced a like-minded individual who was more solitary, prone to inward examination and greater feelings of individuality and imagined independence. The Western experience of Homer Clausus is expressed throughout my book. In the one-bedroom apartments that separate and isolate the characters, in the people they look through, and in the idea of inside and outside that is shown throughout the cover design with its cut-through windows and the book panel and structure. Elias explains how today the effects of the civilizing process on the modern individual are explicit. Bodily acts which humans share are increasingly performed in private with great embarrassment. We have individual meals, private toilets, and birth and death are now confined to hospitals away from the public eye. Elias blamed the idea of the homo closet in setting up a rigid barrier between the person inside the black box and the world outside. But this Western discourse which emphasizes the contained individual is in direct contradiction to the subject experience of the female body, which is invaded through pregnancy, or the homosexual body, which is invaded through penetration. Thus, these bodies become othered.